Hello everyone, welcome back to AS Biology with Dr. Demi. I am Dr. Demi and in today's video, as quickly as I can, I will take you through blood plasma and tissue fluid, which is the second part of chapter 8 of the AS Biology syllabus. So if you don't know yet, we are currently doing transport in mammals, discussing how blood is um, transported across the body or around the body um, and which blood vessels uh, are responsible for that. And what I'm going to do in this video is mainly introduce you to blood plasma and tissue fluid and also discuss how hemoglobin is able to transport oxygen around the body as well as the factors that affect that transportation of oxygen. So um, if you haven't watched the previous video, please make sure you do so. But if you have, uh, feel free to continue with this one. Okay, so the first question, of course, is um, what does blood carry? So if you're already aware, blood carries plasma. It carries some of our dissolved substances such as glucose, some of our waste products like urea, uh, which we pass out in our urine, and it also carries plasma proteins. Um, and that is in addition, of course, to the blood cells. So it carries the red blood cells, the white blood cells, um, and the platelets as well. And the big question students usually ask is, what is blood tissue or what is tissue fluid exactly? Because if blood is something that carries all of these dissolved components, then what is blood tissue? Blood tissue or what we usually call tissue fluid is simply when some of the plasma leak out of the capillaries as blood flows through them. So if you remember in the previous video, we spoke about the different blood vessels and we said that arteries, for example, are responsible for transporting blood at a very high pressure around the body and they carry blood away from the heart. We also said that the veins carry blood towards the heart and they have a much lower pressure. The pressure in the arteries is about 120 millimeters mercury while that in the veins is about 5 millimeters mercury. But we said between that network we also have what we call the capillaries. The capillaries are a very tiny network, they are a very thin network rather of um, blood vessels that allow blood to flow very close to our extremities. So if you think of the fact that your fingernails, for example, would need blood or your fingers rather need blood. But when you think of your fingers, you probably feel a very bony structure. So how then are blood vessels like arteries and veins, which are considerably large, um, supposed to get there? And that is what the capillaries are meant for. But when we speak of the capillaries, blood sometimes, or should we say the liquid in which blood is carried, which is what we call the plasma, sometimes leaks out of the capillaries. And when it leaks out, we call this the tissue fluid. Now, based on the tiny size of the capillaries, what can tissue fluid not contain? The answer to that is that tissue fluid cannot contain red blood cells or white blood cells. This is because these cells are much larger and would not be able to flow out of the holes in the capillaries. So irrespective of what happens, they would stay within the blood vessels um, and then carry on to other parts of the body. Now, when tissue fluid leaks out of the capillaries, then you have a condition we call oedema. And oedema is a condition whereby too much fluid is forced out of the capillaries and it causes an accumulation in the tissues. So you've probably seen um, people who have this condition. You can see that their feet are swollen, their legs are swollen. For some people, it happens in the hands. I've seen people who have this condition in their eyelids um, or ra ra rather under their eyes. And to avoid this, what happens is that the arterioles, so the arterioles are the extensions of the arteries and they're much smaller in diameter. They try as much as possible to reduce the pressure of the blood before the blood gets into the capillaries. And the point of reducing the pressure of the blood is that it ensures that the blood is not forced out. So the liquid is not forced out of the little holes that might be in the capillaries. So imagine if you put something at high pressure through a bag that has holes, definitely there would be a lot of spurting around because the liquid is just trying to be forced out. But if the pressure is quite low, then the spurting won't be as much. And so it reduces the possibility of the tissue fluid leaking out of the capillaries. The tissue fluid is very important because it is the immediate environment of the cells that are in our bodies. And it also allows exchange of materials. So in our tissue fluid, just like we said, you can also have things like your glucose that are being carried in there. Because at the end of the day, tissue fluid is simply blood, but it's the liquid blood is made of. So I often tell students the tissue fluid is plasma. Think of it that way and it makes a lot more sense. It is plasma without the red blood cells or the white blood cells but other materials are able to be carried inside of it and it's a good site um, for exchange of materials between cells and the blood.
You've also probably heard of the word lymph, and some people say they go and drain their lymph um, lymph nodes. So 90% of the blood that would flow out of the capillaries, so 90% of the liquid rather that flows out of the capillaries through those tiny holes, tends to flow back into them. So sometimes you've probably noticed that you sit for a while, your feet get, get swollen, but the moment you start to walk around, everything seems to just go back to normal. Um, some of the fluid that flows out of the capillaries that might cause swollen, swelling in a certain part of the body are also able to flow back into the capillaries. However, the remaining would be collected and returned to the system, that's the circulatory system, through what we call the lymph vessels or the lymphatics. So if you look at this image um, over here, I'm just going to use my pen um, and let's see. If you look at this image over here, you can see that, that this green here is denoted as a lymph capillary. So it's not part of the atrial, it's not part of the vein. Um, or the venule, which is what an extended vein would be, a smaller diameter of a vein um, would be the venule. Uh, but you can see that there's a different network over here of green vessels, and we call those the um, lymphatic system. Lymph vessels have values which allow, or they have valves, sorry, that is a misspelling, that allow liquids to flow in but not out. So if liquids are able to flow in, then they simply help to keep all the liquids in vessels so that we do not have swelling in any part of our bodies. They also help to remove excess protein from the blood and if excess proteins are not removed from a person's blood, that person could die in a matter of 24 hours. So what does blood contain in addition to things like glucose, urea, and some of the mineral ions that are important for our functioning? Well, blood contains the red blood cells. These are very important because they contain hemoglobin, which is also responsible for, tra for transporting oxygen around the body. Um, they contain white blood cells, and the white blood cells are really what make up our immune system. And when we get to immunity, which is our last chapter for this um, syllabus, we will discuss that in detail. And they also contain contain platelets. Now platelets are the blood um, organelles that are responsible for the clotting of blood. So if you have a cut um, on your arm or your leg or you scrape your knee, whatever the case may be, you will notice that you're not going to bleed out continuously. Um, you only bleed for a while and then the blood clots. This is very important because here's an interesting fun fact that you only have five liters of blood in your body and it has a mass of about five kilograms. And not many people know this, so people tend to assume that there's a lot more blood, but it's actually only five liters. So if the platelets are not functional, there's a very high chance of an individual bleeding out from something that could simply be, that could be a simple injury. So the platelets are very, very important for that reason. So let's delve into the red blood cells for a bit. The first thing you should know is that the red blood cells are also called the erythrocytes. And this is important because sometimes when students look at question papers and they see the word erythrocytes, they tend to be thrown off simply because they haven't learned that this is another name for red blood cells. It is also important for you to know that the red blood cells first form in the liver. And just as a, as a fun additional fact that you want to know is that the liver is a star organ in the body. It is responsible for detoxifying your body. So if you consume things like alcohol or poison, the liver as much as possible tries to detoxify that in a bit to keep you alive. Uh, so it is an organ that you need to take very good care of. And as people grow older, um, the part of the body that takes over the um, production of the red blood cells is the bone marrow. This becomes very important in addressing conditions like sickle cell anemia. When people have sickle cell anemia, it's usually because the body is producing um, deformed red blood cells, so sickle-shaped red blood cells that are unable to transport oxygen properly and can sometimes get stuck inside the blood vessels. And as a, this is often a result of genetics, definitely. But what has happened in recent times um, that we've seen is that bone marrow transplant has been able to help some people who have sickle cell anemia. Because if they can get a healthy bone marrow that makes healthy red blood cells, then it sort of solves the, um, the, the situation. But the issue, obviously, is that this is not yet uh, well fully developed as far as I know. But it would be nice for you to read up a bit about it and just maybe learn something new.
Now, when we speak of the structure of the red blood cells, I often tell students that it is best for you to remember it in terms of the shape, the size, the flexibility, and the presence of organelles. If you differentiate it in this way, it makes it easy for you to recall the information. So in terms of shape, the red blood cells are shaped like a biconcave disc, um, and it means like it's basically a round shaped structure, but it has a dent in the center on each side. So think of it as one of those mean sweets that you like to munch on when you are bored. Um, it looks something like that. And the point of this dent is that it increases the surface area so that the red blood cell is able to um, diffuse, um, to transport oxygen a bit faster, or basically oxygen can diffuse faster into the red blood cell. It is very small in size. The diameter is about seven micrometers. Um, and obviously this helps to keep the hemoglobin closer to the cell membrane so that there's a quick exchange of oxygen. It's very flexible and it can deform itself in order to pass through vessels. It can be squashed and returned back to its normal shape after passing through a vessel. So this is not the same as having a sickle shaped red blood cell that can stay stuck inside the blood vessels. These are rather deliberate def um, deformations that allow the red blood cells to squeeze into um, certain parts of the body um, and then once they come out they're able to pop up back to their normal shape. You also have the presence of organelles and what you would find with the red blood cells is that they don't have a nucleus, they don't have a mitochondria, they also don't have endoplasmic reticulum. The main ingredient that they carry is hemoglobin and you will see why hemoglobin is so important as we go on in this video. The white blood cells, on the other hand, they are like the armies of our bodies. They fight for us whenever we are infected. And in this time of COVID-19, they become even more important because if your white blood cells are not as functional, then you might have a compromised immune system. White blood cells are also called leukocytes and they are also made in the bone marrow. Please again take note of the name um, leukocytes because students again tend not to pay attention to that. When it comes to the presence of organelles, white blood cells have a nucleus and the shape of the nucleus depends on the type of the white blood cells. I would not worry too much about that bit of information now because when we get into immunity, which would be the last chapter and probably the last video we'll do for this channel, um, you will learn more about the different white white blood cells. Uh, most of them are larger than the red blood cells and they can be spherical or sometimes irregular in shape um, depending on what their function is. So let's look at hemoglobin in a bit more detail and I hope you remember this because when we discussed biological molecules I think there was a section there where we talked a bit about hemoglobin and we said that hemoglobin has two alpha globins. Um, these are proteins by the way, polypeptide chains. So it has two alpha globins and it has two beta globins. So if you want to look at it in terms of the visual representation, that would be one globin, this would be another globin, this over here would be a third globin and this would be a fourth globin. What is very important to also note is that each globin molecule has what we call the heme group, where hemoglobin gets its name from. So it's spelled H-E-M-E, -E, the heme group. And that heme group binds to, a, to an ion molecule, and each ion molecule is then able to bind to oxygen. And this is important, and obviously, um, I, I guess this helps you understand why ion is important. Sometimes when you feel faint or your blood levels are low, you would be advised by a doctor to take an ion supplement, um, simply because ion helps with the transportation of oxygen around the body. It is part of the hemoglobin structure which is also found, which is typically found inside the red blood cells. Um, and what you need to know is that the primary function of hemoglobin is to transport oxygen and one molecule can, one hemoglobin molecule that is, can transport four oxygen molecules, which is basically eight oxygen atoms. If you think of the fact that one oxygen molecule is O2, so if you multiply that by four, that's going to give you eight oxygen atoms by one hemoglobin. So what affects the ability of hemoglobin to bind to oxygen? Well, that's actually partial pressure, or should we say the partial pressure of oxygen is one of the factors that determines if hemoglobin will be able to bind to oxygen. Now, one thing that is very important to know is that hemoglobin is affected by a couple of things that would affect its ability to transport oxygen. But when the partial pressure of oxygen is high, you would find that the oxygen saturation of hemoglobin is also high. And what that simply means is that when oxygen binds to hemoglobin, it changes the structure of hemoglobin in such a way that more oxygen is encouraged to bind and that 
happens until the hemoglobin is saturated however if you have a very low partial pressure of oxygen then it's difficult for hemoglobin to be saturated this graph is usually called the hemoglobin dissociation curve uh, but you'll see why it's called dissociation when we go um, a little bit further or on the next slide rather uh, but what is important to know here is that if you look at this table when you look at it when there's just like one kilopascal of oxygen the percentage saturation is about 8.5 but a small change in that by just moving it up to two kilopascals almost triples the saturation of hemoglobin which basically means that a small change in the partial pressure of oxygen can cause a very large change in the amount of oxygen that is bound by hemoglobin and the higher the partial pressure the more hemoglobin is able to bind now, why should we care about the amount of oxygen hemoglobin is able to carry? At the end of the day, its primary role is to transport oxygen. So it shouldn't matter if the concentration is low or high as long as it gets the job done, right? But that's not always the case. Hemoglobin, um, as we will find, is not a very specific protein. Um, it actually has an ability to bind to carbon dioxide as well as it binds to oxygen. And so what this means is that the amount of oxygen available is affected or rather the amount of oxygen transported by hemoglobin is affected by the amount of carbon dioxide that is present in the blood. When carbon dioxide is present in the blood, it is converted to carbonic acid. Carbonic acid would dissociate to form the hydrogen ion and the bicarbonate ion, um, which I have circled here on the slides. Now, when there's a lot of hydrogen ions or when there are a lot of hydrogen ions in the blood, what that means is that the blood becomes more acidic. Now, hemoglobin doesn't want that. Hemoglobin, as much as possible is trying to keep the blood at a stable pH as well as transport oxygen. So what hemoglobin does is that it would bind to the hydrogen ions to form what we call the hemoglobinic acid. And in the process of doing that, that affects its ability to bind to oxygen. So the ball shift simply says that even though you have an increase in the partial pressure of oxygen, if there is CO2 present, you will find that um, the, the curve, the S curve that we saw on the previous slide, starts to move towards the right. So I know the slide is not very clear, but if you look here, this is a partial CO2 pressure of 20. So when there's just 20, um, what's it called, kilopascals of carbon dioxide, the shift is not that big, which means that even at a low level of oxygen, hemoglobin can still be well saturated. But you will see that as we increase the partial pressure to 40, and I think this is 60 over here, then we start to see a shift towards the right, which is suggesting to us that the amount of oxygen oxygen that is now required to saturate hemoglobin is higher. So basically what you're trying to say here or what we're trying to say here is that as much as possible, you don't want CO2 in your blood in an excess that will cause hemoglobin to dissociate from oxygen and instead go and bind with the hydrogen ions that are in the blood. So the effect of carbonic acid on hemoglobin, just like I explained earlier, is that hemoglobin would remove the hydrogen ions um, that is caused from this um, conversion of CO2 to carbonic acid. And of course, this is beneficial because we don't want the blood to be acidic. But again, what it means is that when CO2 is present at a high pressure pressure, hemoglobin lets go of oxygen a lot faster and it instead goes to mop up the hydrogen ions. And this affects its ability to simply deliver oxygen to the right place. Places. Something else that I should also add, which surprisingly is not on the slide, is that hemoglobin is also able to bind to carbon monoxide. And in some cases, that binding is irreversible and very damaging. Um, and that is why you're often advised not to stay in an environment with high carbon monoxide levels. That is it for me today. Um, that is all that I have for you on this section. Uh, the next section will focus on the cardiac cycle, and that would bring us to the end of transporting mammals. We will then be able to start chatting. Chapter 9, which, see, which speaks about uh, gas exchange and smoking, which is very interesting. So I hope that you enjoy that. Have a good time and uh, check out the other videos that I have done using notes from my classroom. Enjoy and goodbye.